In this video, we're going to discuss interest rate swaps. When I first saw an interest rate swap, I thought, what a strange contract. It didn't make a lot of sense to me. And <clears throat> it takes a little bit of thinking about and a little bit of uh, playing around with to get a sense of exactly what this contract does. It is an incredibly liquid contract. People trade interest rate swaps all the time, so it's worth understanding. To start, it's probably easiest to think about the first swap deal. This gives us a sense of what's going on. Okay, so during the early 1980s, the World Bank found that interest rates in West Germany, again, we have to go way back now, but the interest rates in West Germany and Switzerland were lower than those in the United States. And unfortunately, they borrowed the most they were allowed to in those two countries. So there were some covenants in the setting up of the World Bank telling them where they could borrow from. Okay. Conversely, IBM had issued loans denominated in Deutschmarks and Swiss francs during the 1970s, but realized the US dollar had appreciated versus these currencies and lowered the value of these loans. So in August 1981, Solomon Brothers, now Solomon Brothers is now part of Citi, organized the first swap on a notional of $290 million. The World Bank borrowed dollars, which they were allowed to, by selling euro bonds, that's what dollar denominated bonds were called, and converted them into Deutschmarks and Swiss francs. The World Bank and IBM then exchanged each other's obligations. So before anything happened, IBM had borrowed in Deutschmarks and Swiss, back, Swiss francs and wanted to repay in dollars. So they had Deutschmark and Swiss francs investors. And the World Bank wanted to borrow in Deutschmarks and Swiss francs, but was unable to do so, but was allowed to borrow in dollars. So afterwards, the World Bank borrowed in dollars. IBM had this position which it already had. And this thing in the middle is the swap. <clears throat> so World Bank paid IBM Deutschmarks and Swiss francs, and IBM paid the World Bank US dollars. Okay, so if we think about their position for a second, IBM has Deutsche Mark and Swiss Bank investors in their bonds and their loans and is receiving those cash flows from the World Bank. IBM, on the other hand, has to pay dollars. So it's like IBM has borrowed in dollars. The World Bank borrowed in dollars, but is receiving those dollars from IBM. Instead, the World Bank has to pay Deutsche Marks and Swiss francs, so it's like the World Bank is borrowed in Deutsche Mark and Swiss franc. In this contract in the middle, the paying Deutsche Marks and Swiss francs from World Bank to IBM and the paying dollars from IBM to the World Bank is a swap. Okay, so a swap, really simply, is an agreement to exchange cash flows at specified future times according to rules. Typically, swaps have two legs, as there are two parties. For swapping cash flows. So counterparty A agrees to pay counterparty B a set of cash flows. Counterparty B agrees to pay counterparty A a different set of cash flows. Typically, if these cash flows are the same currency, then we'll net them down and we'll just pay a certain amount, the net cash flow. will either go from A to B or B to A, depending on the two cash flows. Sometimes, on the other hand, like in that original example, the cash flows just happen. They're in different currencies, and so Deutsche Marks and Swiss francs flows one direction and dollars flow the other direction. There are lots of different types of swaps. We're going to talk about interest rate swaps here. And typically, not always, but typically, this is exchanging fixed known cash flows versus cash flows linked to some reference index. Currency swaps, that's really what that original swap was. That's exchanging fixed payments in one currency versus fixed payments in another currency. We could <clears throat> extend this a little bit and have fixed payments in one currency versus cash flows linked to a reference index in another currency and so on. So we can do all sorts of things here. We have equity swaps, fixed cash flows versus the return on an equity index. We have commodity swaps. We have all sorts of swaps out there. Okay, so what we're going to talk about are vanilla interest rate swaps. So this is an agreement to swap fixed rate cash flows for floating cash flows over a specified period of time. We have a principal amount, a million dollars, ten million dollars. This is the sort of amount of money on which these cash flows are going to be calculated. We have maturity, say five years or two years or 50 years, how long those exchanges happen. We have a tenor, how often they happen. This is in months. 
so three months, six months, 12 months. In the US, standard interest rate swaps have fixed and floating payments every year. In the US, floating cash flows reference compounded LIBOR. Now, they could reference something else. They used to reference, sorry, compounded SOFR, I said. They used to reference LIBOR for years and years. LIBOR has gone, <clears throat> gone away, really, um, and been replaced by SOFR. And so in the US, these things reference compounded SOFR. So let's have an agreement here. Oops. So this is an agreement by a company to pay six month compounded SOFR, and we're going to receive in exchange a fixed rate of 4.4% per annum every six months. The start date's 20th November, 2023, maturity 20th November, 2026, notional is $100 million. So payments, and I'll give you a picture of this, but the notional is $100 million. We're going to look at these cash flows on a notional of $100 million. So let's look at this here for a second. Every six months, starting six months from that November date, we're going to exchange cash flows. The fixed side, and I represent that with a solid arrow going up, and again, going up meaning we're going to receive that, the company's receiving a cash flow on an interest rate of 4.4%. It's an actual 360 rate, so it's 4.4% times the number of days between 20th November and 20th of May, divided by 360. The other side, the cash flows they're going to pay is on SOFR. So we're going to compound SOFR between the 20th of November and 20th of May. We're going to figure out what that is. That's going to be some rate. And we're going to offset, we're going to calculate a cash flow, 100 million times SOFR, whatever that is, times actual days over 360. And we're going to net the cash flow down and exchange it. Either the company's going to pay if that SOFR rate is higher or the counterparty is going to pay if that 4.4% is higher. Now, <clears throat> again, between 20th November 23 and 20th of May 24, we don't know exactly what that SOFA rate is going to be. We're going to figure it out just prior to the 20th of May 2024. Okay, so we can predict some cash flows here, and this is using an expected compounded SOFA. And so, we know the fixed cash flows, that 4.4%, $100 million times 0 0.044 times days over 360. That's where these 2.22 million, the 2.25 million, the 2.21 million, and so on comes from. Expected compounded SOFR, we're going to have to use a yield curve of some sort. Again, on the 20th of November, the yield curve is inverted, so you see these rates coming down. But these are expected compounded SOFR rates. And we can probably look at these a little bit. We have to do some work from the, because this goes out three years, from the three month SOFR futures contracts. But however we get this, these are the expected compounded SOFRs. We get a floating cash flow, 100 million times rate times days over 360. We're paying those, so negative 2.72 million, negative 2.55 million, and so on. And we get a net cash flow. The company pays half a million dollars, the company pays $300,000. These two netted out to pretty much the same number. The company receives 0.24 million and so on. Now, we in this slide, we used predicted compounded SOFR to extrapolate cash flows. And we don't know that SOFR rate until just prior to the cash flow being paid. And the outcome on the swap, what actually happens, can be very different than what's predicted. Okay, so why do I care about this interest rate swap? So imagine I have a fixed rate liability, like I'm a company, I've issued a bond. I can use the interest rate swap to receive fixed and pay floating and transform my fixed rate liability into floating rate liability. Alternatively, I have a fixed rate investment. I can use the interest rate swap, an investment that's paying me fixed rates. Let's say I own a bond. I can use the interest rate swap to pay fixed, receive floating, I receive fixed on the investment, I pay it out in the interest rate swap, I receive floating, net, I'm receiving floating, and I transform my fixed rate investment into a floating rate investment. Okay, so let's look at some of these use cases more carefully. So let's say I want to look at just outright exposure. I want to make money from interest rates going up. Question is, do I pay fixed or do I pay floating on an interest rate swap? Well, I want to make money 
for interest rates going up, I want to receive floating and pay fixed. And if I'm right, interest rates go up, the floating leg of the interest rate swap will become more valuable. If I want to profit from falling interest rates, <clears throat> then I want to pay floating. Pay floating, receive fixed. If I'm correct, the falling interest rates mean that the money I have to pay will go down. The money I receive from the fixed rates will stay constant. So I can use an interest rate swap to simply profit from changes in interest rates. Okay, I can transform existing bonds. Let's say I'm a treasurer of a corporation and I've issued a three-year bond at fixed rates. I'd like to introduce my, reduce my interest costs if interest rates fall. Well, I'm already paying fixed. What I'd like to do is receive fixed on the interest rate swap and pay floating. If rates fall, then I pay less interest. And let's look at this. Here's a fixed rate bond, three-year bond, semi-annual coupons, fixed payments 4.4%. Again, these payments are typically on a 3360 basis, like corporate bonds are. But this is my bond. I can enter into a swap, swapping fixed for floating. This is the swap we looked at earlier. And now I'm receiving, in this case, 4.4% every six months, and I'm paying SOFR. If I combine those two exposures, what do I see? I end up with a floating rate note, or essentially a floating rate note, where I'm paying SOFR. The fixed rate I pay on the bond and the fixed rate I receive on the swap cancel out, and I end up paying SOFR until maturity, and I have to pay back my principal. Okay, I can also use this to hedge bond portfolios. Right? I manage a portfolio of 10-year fixed rate bonds. I'm concerned about rising interest rates. Do I pay fixed or receive fixed on the swap? Again, on my bonds, I'm receiving fixed. If I pay fixed on the swap, receive floating, essentially I've turned those bonds into floating rate notes. Bond issuance. I haven't issued the bond yet. Let's say I'm a corporate, sorry, I'm a corporate treasurer about to issue a new bond and I want to issue a floating rate note. The market in corporate bonds is typically fixed rate debt. So what do I do? I issue the fixed rate bond because that's what the market prefers and enter into an interest rate swap where I receive fixed pay floating, same example as we saw before, receive fixed pay floating and essentially I've issued a floating rate note. Future bond issuance. Let's say I'm a corporate treasurer and I'm going to issue a 10-year bond, but I'm not doing it right now. I'm going to do it in the next six months. <clears throat> I'm worried that rising interest rates will make this more costly. I could go short the 10-year note futures contract to protect myself from this risk, or I could pay fixed on a forward starting interest rate swap starting in six months. If I pay fixed on a forward starting interest rate swap starting in six months, if interest rates go up, the money I'm going to receive, the receiving floating on this swap, is going to offset the cost of the increased interest. I hope that's helpful as an introduction into interest rate swaps. They're wildly traded. There's tons and tons of trading in this, in this um, product, and it's used both for speculative purposes. I want to see, I want to profit from changes in interest rates, but also very, very often for hedging bond issuance, bond portfolios, and so on.